as the program guy, one of the things I've been looking most forward to are our Thursday night meetings. It's time to be a little bit more relaxed, talk about some fun stuff, such as Dallas County mass mandates, which our guests have been speaking about this evening. But, um, no, so one of my big passions in life is music. So anytime you come to my house, there's always music going. It could be anything from Finnish metal to 60 psychedelic music. You never know what you're going to get. It's a great stuff. So had the idea, but didn't know who, let's talk about music. And I've had a couple of people, including Ms. Karen Brown, give me a name. So this name is synonymous with the music scene in Dallas. It's literally in his blood, it's in his DNA, the music business. So currently, this gentleman is the general manager of KHYI, the range, which is the single largest 24-7 Americana station in the nation. He's also been over at the Texas Music Revolution Music Festival, which just celebrated its 25th and anniversary. And one of the things that I found most cool and interesting is that his station eschews pretty boy country in favor of the more roots style approach, which is what I like. I'm very picky with my country music. He also has four kids, which I personally find to be the optimal number of children to have. So without further ado, formerly, as of six months ago, Lake Highland's own Joshua Jones.
Jefferson, uh, grew up in Dallas, and eventually moved to New York. He was an opera singer. Um, and his real name was like Marion Slaughter, something like that. But it, he took the names of the West Texas towns, Vernon and Dalhart, and that became a stage moniker. He was known as Vernon Dalhart. And in the 20s and 30s, record labels had not figured out this idea of uh, exclusivity or signing an artist to like your label and your label only. So a guy like Vernon Dalhart would go to RCA and he would record an album. And then a week later, he'd go down the street to Victor, the, the label at the time, and record the same album, maybe a couple different songs, and then go to another label a week later. So these artists, uh, you know, until the late 30s and 40s were recording for all the different, and if you had a hit with one label, well, all the other labels wanted to sign you. It makes sense. So Vernon Dalhart, the first act to ever sign or to ever sell uh, a million records. So that's, that's great. Um, so anyway, you know, the Rollin Dallas Fort Worth and, and uh, Dallas Fort Worth, you may or may not know, is the fifth largest U.S. media market. When Arbitron or Nielsen uh, you know, ranks the markets. Dallas and Fort Worth, number five behind you know New York, LA, Chicago, and San Francisco. And so we've got this really big media pie, and we've got all these radio stations and TV stations that are trying to um, access these different audiences. But it's a huge, sorry, but it's a huge. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So it's a huge audience. Dallas Fort Worth, fifth largest U.S. media market. But a lot of people don't know that it is the single largest country uh, media consumer market in the world. So there's more country music fans in Dallas, Fort Worth, and the 11 County Index area than anywhere else on the planet. So there are country artists, and you guys may be figuring this out with, with uh, Oktoberfest, but there are guys in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth that will play for $50,000 or $100,000 or $200,000 and they'll play all, almost anywhere else in the country for $5,000, $10,000. They, this is their, you know, their breadbasket, the DFW market, and it's so hyper-competitive with all the venues in town and the radius clauses, and now you've got the casinos that are blocking the DFW uh, venues with their radius clauses. It's very, very, uh, it's a very competitive market, and it's only driven prices higher and higher and higher. So I got a, I finished my undergrad uh, 20, five years ago, 26 years ago, and I wanted to be a college professor, but I thought, I'm gonna go do this radio thing for six months, and like I said, that was 25 years ago. Uh, the station, when I got there, was playing top 40 cheesy country music like every other station in the Metroplex. And you would think that Dallas-Fort Worth, the number one country media market in the, in the world, that it, you know, some guys would be doing some stuff differently, but at that time, nobody was. Everybody was playing cheesy bro, disco, flat belly, pretty boy country music. Um, and, and, and it's weird, everybody was copying everybody, nobody was doing anything different. And so KHYI at the time had a 25,000 watt uh, tower just north of McKinney, and you know, you couldn't pick it up very well south of 635, you know, since, uh, uh, ramp that power up to 50,000 watts. The tower is now just north of Frisco. You still can't hear it great south of 635, but, but back in the day, it was, it was substantially worse. And uh, and we were playing the same cheesy stuff that everybody else was. And at that time, I grew up like not liking country music. I grew up around it. And I was, um, as an act of rebellion, I uh, thank you very much, uh, as an act of rebellion, I really didn't like country music growing up. And I didn't realize until I had taken this job that there were cool country recording artists. I thought being edgy and being a country music artist were totally mutually exclusive concepts. And I had an employee who became kind of a mentor for me in my uh, in my early and mid twenties, and he introduced me to guys like Robert O'Brien, like Jerry Jeff Walker, and I, I you know, Ernest Cobb and Hank Senior, and, and a lot of you know old school Johnny Cash. And I, all of a sudden, I realized, man, there, there are guys in the number one country media market in the planet that can sell out almost any venue in town that have these huge fan bases, and no radio station will touch these guys with a 10 foot pole. Why isn't anybody doing that? And so on January 1st of 1997, that's when 
page where I switched from this top 40 country format and became uh, what is known in the industry as Americana. Some people call it Texas, uh, Red Dirt, uh, you know, all country, hard country. There's a lot of different names for it. In the industry, it's known as Americana, but that's what we do. And so we've been doing it 25 years. Uh, I, I lived with my parents in Rockwell. I grew up in Rockwell. My parents moved out there before there was even a lake. And I mean, we're, we're like old school. My dad was the mayor. And when um, uh, I had such little prospects in going for me, uh, going for me when I got out of college, that I lived with my parents for about a year. And that's before George Bush uh, was uh, the road president was there. And I would drive from Rockwall through like Wiley and Saxe and Parker and go to our little studio in a small strip uh, mall in Allen at the time, and I would drive by South Fork Ranch almost every day. And I thought, man, that'd be a cool place to have a, uh, a big party and like bring some of these uh, musicians out. You know, there were guys at the time, Dale Watson, Junior Brown, um, that, uh, gosh, Wayne the Train Hancock, guys that our listeners, we were introducing our listeners to, but they'd never seen them in person. And so we wanted to have an event, and we called it a showcase, but it became a music festival. And so a few months, at, literally after I finished college, I started this music festival. And what you guys may have you know, figured out with Oktoberfest, the average lifespan of a music festival is two and a half years. And as Bill said, we just commemorated the 25th anniversary of our Texas music revolution. Thank you. It was, uh, if I knew I was going to be doing it 25 years, I would have named it something else. Um, that's, I think about that all the time. But we actually just did a five-year contract with the city of Plano last year. And you guys, uh, Jack, you all were at our um, most recent one, which was uh, about two months ago. We moved it to downtown McKinney, all walking distance. We had 93 bands, 21 stages, and we sold... We sold it out. In fact, we were the first music festival post-pandemic in the state of Texas, and just to sell it out, uh, and you know, it was, it was quite a, you know, we felt like it was quite an accomplishment. Uh, yeah. So, um, what else? We did a documentary for the 25th uh, music festival. I wanted to do a documentary, and in my head, it was going to be like a fake wedding video, and not a good wedding video, like. You know, your uncle's carrying a VHS recorder on his shoulder, walking around, and it sort of became a real thing. And we brought in this film crew from the TV show Dirty Jobs and Bizarre Foods, and in a even more like really weird uh, turn of events, Keeper Sutherland is narrating the documentary, and so like it's this, it's become this you know this thing that has a life of its own, and so that's that's uh, what I'm spending a lot of my time on right now. Is, is documentary about the music festival. We also had a cataclysmic storm <laughs> Saturday night uh, before Charlie Crockett and Ray Wiley Hubbard took the stage and we had to, um, which is you know, made for great theater with the documentary, but at the time I was pulling my hair out. So uh, if you guys uh, get ready for Oktoberfest, I've got some great rain or shine uh, insurance companies that you should not use. Uh, <laughs> my lawyers are emailing them every day. Um, so yeah, that's that's it. Uh, I did have a couple stupid stories to tell you. Um, I once got chased by a bear with Ray Wiley Hubbard, uh, and I was bummed out. It didn't make it into his biography a couple years ago. I took it personally. Uh, so I was telling I was telling a couple people in my office today. I was going to speak to you guys tonight, and I was like, I think I'm going to tell them the bear story, and they were like, What bear story? So I this is second time I've told this story today. But about 20, so right when I got out of college and I took this job and we switched over to the Americana format, one of the first things I did was I went to this, I got invited to this um, uh, conference and it was called In the Pines. It was put on by Gavin Magazine, which was a trade, uh, a trade rag at the time along the lines of Billboard and R&R. Uh, &R. And Gavin Magazine put on this uh, Americana conference and they put it at, uh, at, on at a campground in New Hampshire uh, on Squam Lake where they filmed it on Golden Pond. And there were only 100 people, and it was all like cabins and bunk beds. It was very charming. And out of those 100 people, there were like 
Jimmy Lou Harris and Ricky Skaggs and a bunch of record label executives. And there's me who's like, I don't know who any of these people are and I'm in over my head. Um, so this, you know, there was a lot of crazy things that happened that first year and it was very, uh, <laughs> just, just such a weird But the second year, they had the same conference, but they moved it to this, these condos in the woods in uh, Lake Tahoe. And there was a band about this time from Oklahoma called The Great Divide, uh, Mike McClure, their singer. They had a hit called um, Pour Me a Vacation, I believe. So those guys, I was going to like uh, see a showcase, see a band playing, and I would pass those guys down a, hall, a hallway, and they're from Oklahoma, so you know they're a little, a little nutty. And they're like, there's a bear outside. And so I'm like, oh man, I, I wanna go see this bear. So uh, Bruce Kidder, who used to work for me, and the uh, members of Great Divide and I, and we go out and we see this bear behind this like condo building, and, it, and it's awesome. And we're sitting there, stay, you know, kind of surrounded it, and it's not doing anything, but it's awesome at the same time. Uh, and then, you know, someone from the uh, condo complex comes out and she says, you guys need to leave that bear alone because if it attacks one of you, we're gonna have to put it down. It's a law they just passed. And I was like, I hope you put this bear down. <laughs> it attacks one of us. I don't understand. But anyway, so the next night, Ray Wiley Hubbard and this uh, lady from Sony and I went to dinner in town at this Japanese food restaurant. And Ray and I, I this is how long ago this was, my rental vehicle was at a Suzu rodeo. Uh, blue Isuzu Rodeo. So uh, Ray and I uh, were driving back to the condo place. Ray's one of my best friends. He's a groomsman at my wedding. Uh, a lot of wacky stories with Ray. But Ray, um, Ray and I are heading back after dinner, and I said, "Dude, do you want to see if that bear's there?" And he says, "Well, yeah, yeah man. I'm like, sure." So we pull up behind this condo building in the woods in Tahoe, in, in Lake Tahoe. And sure enough, on the back steps is this, uh, is this black bear, just where it had been the night before. And we're watching it, and we're watching it, and you know, it's not really doing anything. And then all of a sudden, there's a dumpster you know, that's also behind this building, and there's this uh, sort of uh, horseshoe-shaped chain link fence, I guess, around the dumpster to keep bears and whatever else out. And this, uh, um, uh, this chain link fence is about 20 feet tall. So we watched this bear really, really awkwardly and clumsily climb this fence. I mean, it just looked so awkward and uncoordinated, and it took him probably a minute and a half to climb this 20-foot-tall chain link fence, and then to climb over the other side. I was like, man, Rick, watch this. And so I got out, and I took, you know, this is how I'm going to this story was also. I had a yellow disposable Kodak camera. I was trying to explain to an intern today what that was. <laughs> and she told me, oh, I know what that is. They sell those at Urban Outfitters. So that's that's how old I am is now it's a novel. So anyway, uh, so I got, I walked up to the chain link, I literally walked up to the bear, like inches away from the bear, and like face to face with the bear, but separated by this 20 foot tall chain link fence that it took him a minute and a half to climb. And I take that, you know, a yellow disposable camera and I, right there, just, I hit, you know, I click, bright flash, and that bear climbs back over that fence in like two motions. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I made it back to the car, but like, I had left the door open and I dove in and the bear was there. I mean, it was like the scariest I've ever been in my life. And so, uh, yeah, so, you know, the radio business, the music business is 99% staring at a computer screen, trying to figure out how you're gonna make payroll and sell ads and do all this stuff. Every now and then, something cool like that happens. You get chased by a bear or whatever. So anyway, um, I kinda wanted to open it up and see if you guys had any questions, uh, concerts, music, radio, anything. Yeah, you had your hand first. First song you played, you know, Pancho or I think it was Pancho Lefty. Uh, because uh, Towns Van Zandt actually passed away that same exact day. Uh, and so I believe that's, that's what it was. Yeah, other questions? Yeah. What was the answer to your question? What's your answer to the question of why radio stations are only playing top 40 bro country? Well, it's great. Uh, so I did go back and uh, get a uh, master's degree in media, and my thesis was 
the mass exodus of male country music listeners in the early 1990s. So I could bore you about this. Uh, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version, but I can, might be having to come back and bore you to tears with it at, at a later date. So in the, okay. <laughs> so in the, er, so country music, anybody seen the uh, Ken Burns country music documentary? Man, it is unbelievable. Like even if you don't like country music, it is unbelievable. It is so, so good. Um, and in the, the documentary that we're making right now, we've uh, one of the consultants on that has been a consultant of ours. But uh, country music had always been a southern rural male phenomenon for its entire existence until the early 1990s. And um, you know, you had guys like uh, Billy Ray Cyrus and the lot that it really, you know, the most desirable demographic in advertising and marketing is an 18 to 34 year old female. And country music had never had access to that demo until the early 1990s. And then not only did they have that demo, but they owned that demo. So all of a sudden, before you knew it, uh, in the mid 90s, you had all these Nashville, you know, they talk about like cloning sheep and these cloning laboratories in England, you know, 15, 20 years ago. They've been cloning people in Nashville for like, Decades. So what happened was um, these. Uh, uh, by the mid '90s, you had all these dudes who looked like Calvin Klein models singing about the tribulations of single motherhood, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, not that there's anything wrong with that, but listen, like men were leaving country radio in droves in the mid '90s. So what you saw, and this is part of my thesis, is a um, guys who had. Men were looking for new radio homes. So you saw new sport, new formats like sports radio emerge in the early and mid 90s. You saw guys who would have been popular um, become like pop culture icons like Howard Stern or Rush Limbaugh. You saw classic rock, all sorts of talk radio really started um, having a, uh, uh, a boom or a renaissance in the uh, mid 90s because men stopped listening to country radio. And that was part of the when people ask us what we do at KHYI, a lot of the method to the madness as far as like our programming clock and why we play these songs at this particular time. Dude, we're just a country radio station trying to attract male listeners. And that's really what we've been doing. That's the secret sauce. That's what we've been trying to do for 20, 25 years. People call it a lot of different things, but that's essentially what, what our goal is. Yes? How has Sirius XM Radio impacted listenership um, you know, for us, not a ton, because we're in a major market, obviously, and stuff is really competitive, and radio stations are doing a great job. If you live in Marfa, or you live in, um, I don't know, DeKalb, I mean, if you live in a small market, small town, and you don't have access to, like, really competitive, great radio stations, um, Sirius and XM, they're killing it there. And, you know, they're great companies, and they're... Um, and they're doing uh, something cool, and I've got good friends at, uh, uh, on a couple of those channels. What's that? Yeah, yeah, one of my old, my old morning guy uh, programs, you know, the Outlaw Channel and Willie's Place and a few other channels. Um, you know, the thing about radio, it's almost like this Keith Richards existence. People keep expecting radio to sort of uh, subside or in fact, at the 1939 World's Fair, that's when you know, they, they did the big TV, TV introduction, but industry had stopped investing in radio for several years before that because they thought you know, TV, the introduction of TV, was gonna make radio obsolete. CDs were gonna make radio obsolete. Satellite radio was gonna make radio obsolete. So every, every decade, there's something new that's gonna make radio obsolete, but it's still, you know, got more listeners now than, than ever. No, it's great. So the model's completely changed in the last decade. Um, and uh, I mean, people do still buy albums, and it's weird. Like, if we had a, a band come by the office, uh, the studio this morning, 
uh, they brought us vinyl, and uh, it's weird that you know all these albums that are coming out now almost it's like they uh, as a novelty they're coming out. Uh, they're making vinyl versions of them, uh, and they are tracking downloads, and they're you know their albums are going platinum and, and stuff like that still, but it looks a lot different. There's certainly um, uh, I made it. I made it. Actually, I want to tell a story. I don't want to drop the name, but I'm saying that after I have dropped 25 other names. Um, yeah, so there's no record stores anymore, and there's very, very few of them, and it's just, uh, you know, it, it's a very cumbersome process to try to buy an album. But, so now when a label signs you, uh, they want your 360 rights, I'm gonna call it your 360 rights. So when my, um, uh, Doug and Nancy know my, uh, my wife Kimberly, who is like the biggest rock star I've ever met, and she moved to New York several years ago, she's from, from LA, and was working for a rock booking agency, but her roommate, her best friend that she moved to New York with, is now the head of 360 rights for Sony. And 360 rights means, listen, uh, I've got a great band, and I'm gonna sign, Sony's gonna sign me, but and they're gonna get a cut of all the music I sell, but these 360 rights mean if I sell a t-shirt, if I sell a concert ticket, if I sell a bumper sticker, if I get uh, you know royalty publishing from ASCAP or BMI, um, They've got their hand in every pocket I have as a record label. So there's, you know, there's, there's multiple revenue streams for an artist now, but the record label is on top of all of them. In your, uh, in your professional opinion and knowing the demographics of this area, who would you say would be the best headlining band for upcoming record album? <laughs> <laughs> You know, two or three or four. That's a great question. Question. Like rhyming and stealing. Of its kind in the country, in that 
most music festivals that have a radio station name on them, the production company or Live Nation or AEG comes in, puts everything on, and the radio station slaps their name on. Like, dude, I will. We can do that. You go out. That's, it's, it's interesting. It is interesting. But, dude, I will, like, no matter who it is, like this last year, Randy Rogers, Charlie Crockett, Ray, um, Mike and the Moon Pies, and, you know, I'm. I'm texting these guys trying to get these deals done using these 20, 25 years of relationships and leverage so I'm not having to go through William Morris or Paradigm or even Red 11 because uh, I don't I mean I don't want to pay premium and I'm a, and I'm in the most competitive market in America and I'm running a mom and pop and so dude I've got I've got it I've got to take I've got to go find somebody that normally gets a hundred thousand dollars a show and have them come play for me for forty thousand dollars a show and that's good. Can you be my best friend? <laughs> <laughs> Please think. Possibly. All right. All right. Yes. Who would you recommend on a reasonable budget? Who would you recommend on, a, on a budget? Okay. And can you help us make a break? Can you make us an introduction? First of all, I probably have outlined my goggles. Let me. Hey, hey, hey. Roll on. Okay. <laughs> Kenobi that you yeah. check in with every now and then. But this is also something. So I have a consulting firm and I've, you know, I got it off the ground with Shiner Bach and I've, you know, I've got bowl games and um, and two cities. I only have like uh, enough bandwidth for probably four or five clients a year, but that's something I actually get paid to do. But I'd, I'd love to sit down with you guys pro bono at least once and just sort of, you know, walk you through. I think that I, I would. Joke in there, but yes. No, no, but I would say the. Jimmy, this is Joe. Okay. <laughs> People are paying to see him at an arena with Tyler Childers, and it's like selling out or getting close to selling out. It like absolutely blows my mind. Occasionally, guys will make a lot of money, and I'm like, it'll be somebody I know, and they'll 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 go from like the first or second rung on the ladder to like way above the ladder, and and again, someone I know personally, and someone I know their music, and I'm just like, that makes no sense. I mean, Sturgill's great. I just, again, so um, we were at a uh, like a cocktail party at the BMI offices about five years ago when we were in Nashville, and um, <laughs> I can make a small talk with a fence post. I can find something to make small talk with you about. And dude, I tried my, we were introduced by a mutual friend, and um, I tried so hard 
I mean, the dudes from Kentucky, I, tr I, tr I mean, I pulled every Kentucky card I had out of my bag. I, I mean, these yeah. ex-military, all this stuff. I just got, I mean, all I got was like, yeah. Uh-huh. Oh. And I mean, like, that's all I got. And it was like five or 10 minutes of that. And I finally gave up. And then, and then I had to leave. I was going to a showcase uh, in Nashville. I was getting on the elevator trying to just sneak out, and then all of it, like, you know, my offices are on the fifth floor of this building, and um, like the door is closed, and it's almost completely closed. I'm on the elevator by, by uh, myself, and then I see a hand like wave to stop the motion of the uh, the elevator, and the ele and I'm thinking in the back of my head, gotta let it be that a hole. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, that's who it was, and we just like looked the opposite direction and on the elevator for. Anyway, so it's too much information. Yeah. Do you have to do a lot of marketing to promote the station at 95.3? Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, and we're one of the last major market mom and pop uh, commercial stations in the country. You know, uh, you know, to your point earlier also, like um, homogenized, cheesy country music. Um, there was a, the, the second telecom act uh, was signed in by the Clinton administration in 96, and that deregulated radio ownership. So before that, like one company could own one AM and one FM in the same market. And when that got deregulated in the mid nineties, all of a sudden you saw, you know, Clear Channel and Richard and I Heart Radio and Cumulus and Citadel and CBS Radio and all these they went and bought all the mom and pops out in all the major markets and then the large markets and then the media markets. And so what happened is when they um, they would have like one guy in a closet studio in LA and he's the DJ on 200 stations across the country. And he's the program director for, you know, the top 40 station in Tacoma, Washington, and also the top 40 station in Clearwater Beach, Florida. And so all of a sudden, like American culture, from a radio perspective, just got so much more homogenized and playlists got so much more shallower than they had ever been. So we're one of the last holdouts of that post-telecom act deregulation. We need a cornhole tournament sponsor. We have our favorites, you know, Jack Ingram, Ace Carl there. I got Max and Heather and Jamie Lynn Wilson and Prophet Snavlov here. Yeah. Can you just give us a handful of who your favorite Texas singer songwriters are currently today? Man, I'll tell you, one of the hottest acts in the country is in it, it's backyard here in East Dallas, and that is um, Joshua Ray Walker, and if you're not on, on uh, yeah, you, you know, he doesn't fit the image of your traditional uh, rock star, but he is, according to Rolling Stone magazine, uh, he had the fifth ranked country album of 2020, so, and literally the guy is born and raised and still living in East Dallas. Again, as you Google him or whatever, you're gonna look at him and you're like, wait, he's a country singer? But yeah, he is, and he's got Nashville work. He's, his agent is a buddy of mine in Nashville. He just signed uh, a management deal with, a, with a, um, a huge company in Seattle, and man, he is, yeah, he's, he's one of the best guys. Uh, I mean, he's a sweetheart. Uh, what's the, uh, the Mexican food place uh, next to the green spot? Uh, El Vicenzo? Yeah, yeah. El Vicenzo. Yeah, yeah. So, Every time I walk in there, I see, I see Joshua Gray Walker. Uh, he would be one. Chris Knight's one of my all-time old-school favorites. Uh, you know, I was the first one to bring Chris's music to Texas. I, I'm still, I've always been really proud of that. Um, God, man, I'd have to like. Uh, I also have to say, Mainly Thomas Band. I can't believe. Yeah, Mainly's great. Yeah, I'll, I'll think about that. I got too many to choose. Yeah. studios about 
10 years ago, and he kept calling them Restless Kelly <laughs> over the air. And it's still a joke at the radio station. And, and we still, like, whenever I see you know, Mickey and, and those guys, I, I, or Willie, I always just always uh, joke with them about being Restless Kelly. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. I mean, all your comments have been fantastic. Let me ask you another KXY question. So, your format's unique, but also what has been unique about it, I'm getting one of the lists here. I, I'm a Texas Renegade radio guy that finally found a 24 hour format for that music. Bruce, Brett, Adley, Nadine, Little John, Boone, <coughs> Alan Peck. Where did you find these people to support that format? Because they created touch points with, with your listeners. Yeah. That, Raiders come back and, and keep listening to them for me. Man, that's great. Uh, that's a great question. I appreciate that. I appreciate you, your, your support the station as long as you have. Um, and we've had a lot of uh, interesting personalities uh, come through the doors. And um, usually somebody was recommended by somebody else in a smaller market. And I had a, 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 a boy to fill. And some of those guys came on organically uh, doing weekends. And then next thing you know, they're doing nights. Next thing Shuffle some stuff around. Natalie, um, the only girl, or the only person I've ever hired with no experience off the streets was Natalie uh, Leffler, and she um, she's just like totally had it factor, man. And, and uh, I don't use that term lightly. And I hired her and let her, like I said, just do that. You know, pour it off on weekends, and then start doing the nights. And then for, for long, she was doing uh, uh, she was doing mornings for me for a while, and she actually was nominated for. CMA for uh, Radio DJ of the Year at the station she's at in Tulsa now a couple of years ago. So she's the first person I ever hired with uh, with no experience. But uh, yeah, man, it takes weird people to go into radio. You know, it's, it's just a lot of times people. You know, my members speak to a college class. They're like, man, you know, should I do this? Should I do that? Should I blah blah blah? I'm like, bro, go the other way. <laughs> like, don't go into radio. You know, it's it's uh, it's tough to break it into that, you know, tough to break into a major market, and it's um, it's one of those jobs that's uh, it's a lot cooler on the outside um, looking in than it is uh, really on the inside, but a lot of people, even when they hear that advice, don't, you know, don't listen. Those are the really, really special people. So, uh, any other questions? Yes. So, um, you know, it's interesting from a radio station perspective, last, last year we lost 65% of our revenue. Like it was um, financially asphyxiated and uh, we were so top heavy at like music venues and um, restaurants and the businesses they were of course they shut down. And so it, it was really, you know, uh, cataclysmic for us. This year's like the best year we've ever had. And so it's weird. I'm like, I just want a normal year. I don't want the best year I've ever had. I don't want the worst year I've ever had. I want a normal year. Um, but, you know, the artist, I know that they found different revenue streams. Like Hayes Carl, uh, I think you brought, brought up a minute ago. Jack, he's doing a, uh, like a Wednesday night broadcast from his couch, uh, like alone together. And he asked me to, he actually asked me to come on and do a, a segment as a guest a couple weeks ago for that that uh, that YouTube show he has or that he's doing. But some of these guys have gotten creative and figured out different ways to, uh, to do some of this stuff. Um, but what's interesting about that, and also from a music pers uh, from a music uh, festival perspective, is, so my, I actually did my music festival last year. And we did it at Southport, and I rented a couple big LED screens, and we, you know, we did, we did it as a drive-in movie format, and like the first row of cars was 100 feet from the stage, and it was a very weird, uh, I mean, it was a music festival, and it was in Texas, and it was in 2020. As far as I know, we're the only one that actually happened. But the people that were touring at all and playing any shows last year were um, guys who need money, you know? So if you had enough, it was a, booking that festival was, was really weird because we needed a name to sell tickets, probably what you guys are going through, we needed a name that was going to move tickets, but
But guys who were big enough names to sell tickets didn't need the money bad enough to play a show last summer. So it was this real catch-22 weird situation. Uh, and it all worked out, you know. Um, it, was, it, was, it was harrowing at the time, and I lost a lot of sleep over it. We had a lot of investor revenue, um, I'm sorry, a lot of sponsor revenue, uh, a lot of tickets sold, you know, it was, it was uh, we had to have that show happen. And we were able to you know, financially pull it off. We had, um, Beretta was one of our title sponsors. Um, you know, the Beretta company basically became Italy. And, and even though they had spent tens of thousands of dollars to be a title sponsor and had paid in advance, they forbade any of their employees from going to the event just from an optics perspective. Uh, it was just, it was a real surreal uh, situation. So we had sponsors <coughs> and sponsor revenue, but the, sponsor, but the sponsor was not allowed to go to the show. It was just, it was, you guys, don't tell me anything you don't know, because I'm like anything else. Um, but to answer your question, it was um, the only guys playing last year were, were the guys who really needed to go. They're all ready to, to play, and it's it's weird because you could get an agent, like an agent who's got good bands in Nashville. Man, if I called them six months ago, eight months ago, dude, they call me back like within sixty seconds, and now I'm, you know, having to wait a couple of days because they're, you know, places are open, they're busy again. Yeah, who's somebody you like that's about to break big? Somebody you like that's about to break big. Somebody I like that's about to break big. Um, man, I would say. Joshua Ray Walker, who I mentioned earlier. Um, God, there's a um, there's a guy that uh, I've just it's just come on my radar recently. His name's like Nick Shoulders. Uh, I think he's super cool. I'm gonna check him out. Um, I, man, uh, let, me, let me hand you. Let me see my phone. I'll tell you. <laughs> Who's the guy? Dude, I, used, I mean, like.